Hello, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of The Successful Stylist Unfoiled. Today, I am sitting down with four-time educator of the year, three-time men's hairdresser of the year, and a winner of a meat tray at the RSL in 2017. I bet you can guess it, Mr. Jules Pognini. So I feel like Jules is one of those household hairdressing names. Everybody knows who he is, is all about him. And I was really lucky to sit down and chat with him. We actually, this is take two of our chat because he is a friggin' popular guy. And the first recording that we did, we had so many interruptions from him getting phone calls and Wi-Fi and all these things. So I just always tell it like it is. And this is actually take two of this combo. So it was actually really nice to sit down again and just have full attention on both ends. So it was great. And Jules really takes us through how he came up in the industry, how maybe it was a help or a hindrance having his family be so well known within the industry and him coming up following that name. Also how he got in with the product companies that he did and went on international tours. And then also the fact that he has started his own education company and how he wanted to make that unique and yeah it was a really great conversation i always love talking to jules he's been someone who has been so supportive of me through my career over here in australia and was the first person i rang actually when i landed um to get an idea of where to apply for jobs any anywhere he recommended and it, i've been lucky enough to actually take his course as well which is great and i've learned a few few tips that i introduce into my mostly color um, clientele, the cuts that I do do is what I learned from him. So I am really excited about this conversation. I know he's been somebody who has been highly requested when I put the feelers out on Instagram on who you want to hear from. So I really hope that you enjoy this conversation with myself and Jules. Okay. I've worked on my tech. Have you worked on your questions? Well, I've hit... <laughs> I just hit record and now you just totally pegged me out. <laughs> No, I haven't worked on my questions. I thought they were good the first time. <laughs> well, let's go with the first. Let's go with the first round. Uh, all right. So Jules and I are back for take two of our podcast recording. I don't know if we were going to tell people, but I've just let the cat out of the bag. You know, we had a few, just a few technical issues and you've just dropped your AirPod in your teeth. So it seems like round two is not going any better than round one. <laughs> difficulties first time and now second time <laughs> oh you know I actually had Jules scheduled as my season opener I think I said it on my initial opening episode and it just we had a quite a few technical difficulties so we both are going to try and make it a better round two but <laughs> glad you put Tan Via on instead of me much better call him. I put a, a lovely girl on. Oh God, this is good. You're going to be the the mid season pick me up. Yeah, the one they all forget about. How good? <laughs> so funny. Well, Jules and I have a very long standing um, friendship since I've moved to Australia, and I thought, you know, you love to share the story, so I thought you might want to want to break the ice with that love to so we first met do you remember i unfortunately I you remember because i would have thought you didn't remember because <laughs> this one we uh launched uh i was working um, i was working for evo in toronto and we wow. were launching evo in toronto at the distributor and chris at the time was working for the distributor I worked for the salon that owned the distribution company. There you go. Anyway, she was at the opening party, let's say that much. And this party was done at this club, but there was, so a, oh, there was a, it was a very random club, but there was a, um, there was a podium, which we did hair on. But the only funny thing was there was a stripper pole right in the middle of the podium, wasn't there? <laughs> and once we played out and finished hair, Crystal would add about 15 drinks by the stage and thought that she was the halftime act. So um, I, I saw her and I was like, oh, this chick's a legend. Uh, obviously a crowd favourite. And, um, crowd pleaser. Crowd <laughs> pleaser. 
but you did good, mate. So I've never forgotten you, funny enough. See, like it made it pays to just be yourself, I think. Had I been shy and timid and quiet, you know, we wouldn't be here. So the, the message of that is always be yourself. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. You always need, you always need that little opener. You're like, I'm Crystal, remember the girl who was on a stripper pole? And I'm like, oh, yeah. Yep. I remember seeing you for the first time when I moved back here. I'd phoned you a few times. You helped me out with some job stuff, but you were on stage rehearsing at Expo. And I was like, it's me. It's Crystal. Yes. <laughs> oh, God. So funny. You made it. You made it. Now well, look, look at how, you now, hey? I know. Look at me. But yeah. today's actually all about you, which I know you'll prefer to talk about yourself a bit more. Can we just quickly talk about your layers? <laughs> These were a little off the top cutting technique that my friend learned. <laughs> it's a really good square layer. And I'm trying to now learn how to style my hair with layers because I have more hair than anybody in the world. And I have a lot of hair. And now I've been layered, but you know, I'm getting used that to it. That looks good. I like it. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So. I like it. I would love to hear from you, your, how you got into the industry. I mean, obviously now you're a, a I would say a household name in the hair industry. Yes, I am, yeah. <laughs> That's a good one. But how did that happen for you? How did you get into hairdressing? Is that something you always wanted to do? You come from a family that is so involved in the industry and. Um, yeah. Look, never wanted to be a hairdresser. I'll be pretty honest with you. Uh, I went through my life. Um, I guess I didn't see my dad a heat when I was young. He's a, his name's Benny Tolgan. He's a hairdresser. He's a, a pretty big deal over in Australia, especially back in the 90s. Uh, dad had his straps and won all the awards you could ever win. And, you know, dad's definitely a, a very well-respected, but very humble and down-to-earth guy. Um, I saw all this go on. I never thought too much about hair. I never... You know, at that stage, ever had ever paid for a haircut, ever be to a salon, ever had to think about a hairdo. So I think when that's all handed to you, you don't realise how lucky you are. Mm. Um, fast forward a few years, and you know, a few businesses, finished school, um, started my own fashion label uh, that was doing really well. Thought it'd be great to do a gap year. Went on a gap year, came back after a year. Uh, of not working and just having a bloody good time and realised I was broke <laughs> and try to get back into fashion and fashion's really fickle and to get back into it I realised I need a little bit of money to start it up again so I asked mum and dad for a job at the time my brother was working there too and uh, they thought it would be a great idea I don't think my dad was too sure I think he thought I was just uh, not going to take it too seriously Yeah. but um, he offered me a, an apprenticeship he goes if you want to come and work in a salon, you've got to do an apprenticeship. And I was like, okay, what's going go with that? He goes, it's, you know, it's three, four years. And I was like, uh-huh. <laughs> and I'm thinking in my head going, yeah, I'll just start it and just finish it when I've got enough money to kind of continue what I was doing. And the ultimatum was, you can only have the job if you stay for a year and then we can talk about it. And the first year he kind of owned me and we did so much well and went so far. <laughs> that it was really hard to rewind um, at that stage. So yeah, by default, but I guess I know when you've been around hairdressing, it's kind of a little bit in your blood. I don't, I don't do hair like my father. I'm very different um, to the way he does hair. He does it really well. Um, but, um, fake it till you make it. Two yeah, lessons, yeah. be yourself yeah. and fake it till you make it. Exactly right. So yeah, kind of weirdly enough, but. I'm really close to my family. And the fact that the, my whole family were working the business made me realise that I was missing out on something. So yeah. ever since starting, I realised I got myself in so deep that I didn't want to go backwards. And um, yeah. anything I've done in my life, I've always want to give it 100% of my time and effort. So I went pretty hard and started realising that I've gone so far at the point when I reached that first one year that I'd continue it. And then my dad gave me another ultimatum saying, if you want to continue, great. But the only way you're going to finish your apprentice, apprenticeship is you have to win Apprentice of the Year. Oh. And, that, that was. and I was like, right, right. That, how hard can that be? <laughs> and did you so, win it? I did. I did. Oh, I didn't know. I, That's cool. I've now finished my apprenticeship, guys. Well done. 
Just won it last um, year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's taken me 15 years to get there, but I've made it. I've made it. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. I didn't know about your fashion label and that that's kind of what you were. Yeah. Maybe I wasn't listening the first time around. <laughs> Maybe your questions got better, actually. Maybe. Wow. I've been practicing. It's been a few weeks. Yeah. I've had prep. <laughs> Oh, that's so cool. I didn't know that. So did you think that when you started doing the Apprentice of the Year stuff, what did that mean? You had to shoot a collection or you had to have the best marks? Like, what does that mean to win Apprentice of the Year? Uh, Apprentice, Apprentice of the Year uh, at the awards in Australia was 50% on your collection and 50% on what you do to better yourself. So as an apprentice, I guess a lot of apprentices aren't directing fashion shows or teaching around the globe. Um I was just an epic shit kicker and I used to do everything. I never said no to anything. I put myself out there. I had a really, a lot of, you know, I, I don't get me wrong. I've, as much as I've worked my ass off to do what I'm doing, I've had a couple of step ups from my, my dad, I guess. A lot of these amazing, great artists from all over the globe, um, dad would call his good mates. So they, I grew up with them before I started doing hair. I grew up with these people. They were kind of like my uncles and my aunties. And people will give you an opportunity. And same thing is what I do for people now. People give, people give you an opportunity when you're one, not threatening, and two, you're young and you're keen. Yeah. Um, as soon as you become old, threatening, and couldn't give a fuck, people stop giving you opportunities. So same thing happens now with me. Anyone who, who's really keen and, you know, I feel like it has a bit of potential, but happy to do the hard work and, you know, doesn't say no to any opportunities. They're the people that you offer things to as well. So at the time, I was the Kino guy. I was there just, you know, bad smelling myself all around the world. So anytime Dad would go on tour, I'd You'd get myself well. a place on tour. Yeah. I'd pack bags or build wigs till two o'clock in the morning. Um, I'm not afraid of hard work, but it's all good experiences and you and get out you- what you put in. Did you like that? Like, say, doing that shoot, I it's overwhelming in the beginning, but I guess when you have a mentor like your father or your family around you, that would really help you to maybe visualize the shoot. Or what I learned from assisting on those shoots was about creating the vision board. Because I, I would see those shoots and be like, I just don't have a vision to create that. Like, I, I could do it. Like, my, my skill can do it. But where do you begin? So did that help from that point of view? Yeah, totally. Um, I guess where it started was I'd seen a few shoots. I'd been around. I'd done a few fashion weeks at the time. Um, my dad was definitely, Benny was definitely there to make sure I didn't, you know, screw up. Um, but I found all my own models. I did a deal with my photographer at the time. You know, this, like my budget for my shoot was 100 bucks. Like I didn't spend a cent i think my entry fees probably cost me more than anything uh photographer for, was for free my mum's a makeup artist so she did the makeup um i got clients to be models and you know yeah. friends and my first collection was actually all done with um hair pieces and i did this like really tight collection which was all based on fringes and um i'm not known as a colorist but i colored everything i cut everything i placed everything and i think dad was there to you know, just to make sure, like, you know, he gives you the watchful light. He still does it to my shoes today. Yeah. He'll sit in the corner. He'll let you do it all. If he doesn't like it, he'll sit there and just, you know, shake his head. But if he likes it, he'll give you a little eyebrow raise or a nod. And if you get an eyebrow good. raise, but anyone who knows Benny Togdani, you know that that's like, oh, okay. The big dog likes it. All right, let's go. Shoot, 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 shoot. <laughs> so, um, yeah. It was probably my second question I've ever done. I did another one. Um, and I made the finals for an apprentice of the year and um, it didn't, which, which was great and a great, um, a great experience, but this was my second collection I did. So yeah, it was great. That's so cool. And did you find throughout your career, it's a conversation I had with Candy about her family being so involved and friends with Vidal Sassoon and all these people. Did you find that maybe from your peers or from people you were competing against or maybe for roles that, they gave you flack that you were uh, getting where you were from your family? Yeah. Hell yeah. And like part of me, whatever, I didn't, it didn't worry me. I don't get offended yeah. by very much. Like yeah. where I stand and I know how hard, you know, you have to be true to yourself and understand what you do as well. Like I don't, 
I don't like to be disliked and I think I treat everyone the way I want to be treated. But no, 100%. I used to get called Benny, Benny Jr. or the next <laughs> Benny. And look, deep down, I fucking hated it. I was like, I just want to be the first Jules. Like I remember getting offered a job with a big product, one of the big product companies and said, you know, I went to leave and they said, don't leave. We want to make you the next Benny Togdani. Mm. And I said, this is the reason why I'm leaving because I don't want to be the next Benny. As much as I love the guy, yeah. there's already one of him. I want to be the next Jules. Um, I really wanted to stand on my own two feet, but then I also, I use that a lot to get really good experience. But yeah. at the same time, as much as I've worked with some greats, they either nephews or, or children or cousins or brothers, whatever it is, when you have a big name in front of you, uh, you've got to prove yourself as well. So yeah, dad was almost always, more you know, so probably. You work your ass off and don't let anyone say anything negative about you. Um, but it did give me a lot of opportunities, 100%. Yeah. Um, but I think from there, you can take it. There's a, you can either take it on the chin and go and run with it or, you know, be yeah. shit and hopefully you get more handouts. So I and you still, you, you go. I guess first impressions mean everything to me still to this day. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because at the end of the day, you can have the same name and you can be a personality that people don't want to be with. You're always late. You're this, you're that. You, you know, you're a pain in the ass to work with. Well, you are, now that I'm saying all these things, you <laughs> like, oh, I actually am describing you. <laughs> what are you talking about? Late? Pain, pain in the ass? <laughs> I didn't mean it in that way, but just so happened. <laughs> I was trying to say the opposite, you know, that you're not that. And then it came out and I was like, oh, wait. <laughs> you should say, you know, good looking and polite and uh, organized. Yeah. <laughs> True. But how long, like, have you stayed in that salon? So you did your apprenticeship through your, your parents' salon. And that's where you yep. still are based now, correct? Yeah, so we had opened a side salon just before I first started, which was, I used to have a lot of say in it before, before we opened it. It was very much um, a salon that was a, to appeal to a younger generation, which probably got me excited about going in and working mm. in the salon as well. Uh, that you was could called put AKA your creative Talk spin on it. 100%. That was called AKA Talk Danny's. We had that for about 10 years or so. And then we closed that down when we moved the larger salon uh, into the same area. And we kind of just Merged ended up them. closing that down and taking taking that into one um, one salon, which was a large salon, which is we've still got today, which is down in the valley, just um, in the James Street precinct. Uh, and we just re- we just opened a new salon five weeks ago, um, a little salon called Hay Hair. So it's been really good. We, you know, mum and dad are still one hundred percent involved in the business. Me and my brother have taken over the business um, as of last year. So. It's nice to now have a bit more, not so much ownership, but, you know, I guess you're saying the direction you take it to. Yeah. Um, it wasn't broken, so we're not fixing it. We're just, we're bringing a few things, you know, just bringing it in and bringing it up to date. Um, you know, within reason, it's it's a, an amazing salon that's worked for 30, 35 years, just about now. So, um, a huge so yeah, so for mum and dad, wasn't like kicking them out it was like we want you to be a part of it still but we want you guys to enjoy the end of your career and yeah. be in the salon but not get hung down by all the all the stressful things that um staff and clients can bring and running a salon in general and um and for us it's a really good step up as well to take on a bit more responsibility and you know definitely they're still there to be mentors for us but it's um We've got a lot of really good ideas that we now are pushing forward to. Both our wives, myself and my brother, Christian's wives, are getting involved more in the, the cool. branding, the culture and the social media content, um, which is great. But they're getting a bit more of a say as well, realising that these girls are kind of our target market. Yeah. Um, it's been good. It's been unreal. Nice what's little change. Biggest, Everyone's really happy. What's the biggest shock, say, to you that you've now maybe – stepped into your parents role in a way mm. and going into salon ownership and opening a new salon what was the biggest like oh my god I didn't realize they did so much or like what we just like understanding that now the buck stops with you so your your decisions or or what you talk about during the day or you know, more people coming to you directly for you to make a, the end decision. Where before yeah. people would come to me, I'd go, yeah, maybe, maybe something like this, but make sure you talk to Benny about it. 
Yeah, Where now yeah, it's yeah. like making ownership of your decisions a little bit more as well. Um, look, I love people, so it's so does my brother. So I think we put a lot of effort to change maybe the, the staff culture a little bit. We've always looked after clients super well. Yeah. We're realizing now that to run a successful salon um, and to keep your clients happy, you need to have happy staff. So we're putting 100%. a lot more effort into our staff and making sure that they feel like they're you know, getting paid well, their bonuses are great, um, their working environment's fantastic, they're feeling like being heard, um, empowering people to step up. And it's honestly, it's been amazing. Everyone we work with in our team are just fucking incredible. That's so um, great. All in their own right, but everyone, the team, we've got a big team. I think all up there's about 20, 25 of us. And as soon as you have a team, anything over five, yeah, you, it starts kind of getting different little compartments and people turn into their own groups. So to keep it all as a whole and as one, it's a really tough job. And I feel like maybe our job has turned from less about being a hairdresser or an educator and maybe more into that HR world, um, yeah. which is a little bit getting used to, I think, actually. Yeah. And for you, something with the education that I'd love to dive into, because I think that is what you're known for, right, is education. Like that's what you're accolades are in and your awards and all these things that how did that kind of happen for you from going in the salon into educating education probably gave me a, a chance to get away from the salon a little bit um, yeah I get bored really really quickly <laughs> uh boredom said then after about two days of doing the same thing and it makes me realize I need to do something else and I think instead of going back into fashion or changing career path or finding a hobby. Um, I thought, you know, I love work. I'm a bit of a workaholic. So let's try to dive into something that I enjoy still, but still works with the skills that I'm working on every day, but mm. um, in a different environment. Um, the education thing, like, like I said, I love people. I generally love teaching people because I love seeing people grow. I know this sounds a bit cliche, but like, I get stoked when people get those light bulb moments in classes and if it's just helping them, I'm not going to change anyone in a day. But if they can walk away with one new thing that they can take on to improve their hairdressing career and I can give that to them, fuck yeah. Um, I have a good way of connecting with people. I know we have, in education, I have this big thing. Just because you're a good hairdresser doesn't make you a good educator. And vice versa, because you're a good hairdresser. It's yeah. because you're not a, a great um, hairdresser. It doesn't make you not a great educator. It's about trying to figure out how you can you know, share, but also leave your ego at the door, empower people to step up, empower people to have a go at things as well. And, you know, relay the message really clearly. Um, it's probably my favorite thing to do. Um, and you created your own education system, a little off the top, right? Yeah. Is that what you would call it? A system of education? Yeah, I like it. It sounds good. I'm going to use it. What was it? System. Yeah. Let me write that down. <laughs> I'll email it to you. In the <laughs> when I said my invoice. <laughs> <laughs> um, how did you that something that I've had in a few conversations is I feel like I love education that's what I see myself long term doing I love that that feeling as well you what you've said like you you don't get that feeling it's a different thing when you're ple pleasing your client versus when a student is understanding what you're saying it's a completely different energy and sometimes I felt like, how am I going to get to that point where I'm able to educate someone when I don't maybe have the original idea of what I'm doing, what I'm doing on my client, I learned from someone else. So how can I then go teach that? Mm -hmm. So how did you then come up with your education system and make it, I guess, original or how, how did you do that? Yeah, right. Um, I guess it's when a little off top came to came to earth it kind of was based on all the things that I was frustrated with with education so I was doing education for a couple of product companies at the time um I reckon a little time's probably about eight years old nine years old now so yeah, about eight years so I've been hairdressing for 14 years so you know I would have been about six years through hairdressing I had done a little bit of teaching for a couple of um the big um beauty companies which was great gave me some runs on the board um, and it gave me an option that uh, to see enough and to do enough to realise what I do like and what I don't like, like the things that was letting it down, the boring parts and the mm. fun parts. And I realised that when I learned, 
I only I learned better as a hairdresser with a you know I have a very small uh, attention span mm. and I was leaving classrooms all the time because I was just like I'm listening to someone in the front row tell tell the teacher about a client that they have and it had nothing to do with me and I just realized I was like nah I'm le- I left the room I'm sure there's a bunch of other hairdressers that are doing the same thing how do you make this more fun and more engaging to make pe- sure people get it I realized a lot of people I'm teaching were young and that was my market, 100%. Um, I probably wasn't appealing myself to people who've been hairdressing for 20 or 30 years at the time anyway. Yeah. Um, but I did have a youth voice. Um, I had done a lot in my, sh- in my short space. I'd won a lot of awards and toured a lot and been traveling around the world with education. It was more of a bit of a thing saying, you guys can do this too. It's just about understanding what you do and understanding your path and, setting up your own brand. And that was kind of the thing we got to do with Lit Off Top. And we originally created it purely to change and put, put education on its head a little bit and go, okay, no one's doing private education at the time. Um, everyone's working with brands and yeah. that was great. But brand, when brands, when you work for brands, brands tend to own you. I know it's changing a little bit these days, but there's no such word as collaboration. Um, I, went, I was working with a company called Evo at the time yeah. And I mentioned it to them going, hey, I'd love to teach some cutting. That's what I do. And they were like, look, we're not big enough to put a cutting program in just yet. So you'll just be teaching styling. And I'm like, not really. Yeah, not that's not satisfying me. Yeah. I think your brand. So I came and pitched them an idea going, how about you collab with me? I want to start my own education company. You support me and help me get it up and running and support me with putting it out to the masses. I'll use your product and yeah. I teach my stuff. And I do it all in the way that you love, the, re- the reason why you love me, I do it the same way, but I do it as a voice for both of us. And um, that's kind of how it really started. Um, since then, we've grown a lot. Um, we went through a whole um, vibe of doing classes all around Australia and New Zealand, um, doing more fundamental based classes. When we first started, it was more trend based. And I realized that haircutting 15 or, 12, or 14 years ago when I started, cutting was cool. Like people knew how to cut hair. Yeah. These days, it's like you learn what you learn at college, which is bare minimum. And you don't really understand at the time as well. Not that they're not great teachers. It's just a lot of information on structure that you're not really keen on at the time. Yeah. Whereas now, if I took that class, I'd be so engaged in that. You would be because you understand hair. Yeah. But doing it at the time, I couldn't have cared less about cutting because I knew I wanted to do color. Exactly. And it's the same. Yeah. And even colour was probably yeah. still a bit boring because you're still trying to figure out how it all works. Yeah. Same reason why a lot of us didn't love school for, we love school for the social aspects, but learning the lessons and doing the classes, we weren't really into it. You leave school and you pick one of those classes that you want to dive into, you're 100% into the thing that you want to do. Yeah. So we came back and created a class called Meat Potatoes. So the reason why we called it Meat Potatoes was based around your fundamentals, your staples. Um, and we created um, a chicks and a dudes cutting class, more boot camp style. So the meat potatoes chicks is like an eight module, it can be done four days back to back. Yeah. Um, so three, about three hours a module. And the men's was about five modules over two days. And the idea was it was just to get people to understand what they were learning at college. Um, as soon as you finish college, you get into the floor, you go into the salon, you learn so much by doing. So as much as it was great for newbies, it was awesome for those people who are new to the floor or new seniors or used as a refresher and then also great for people who wanted to train their staff and give them a bit of a system thank you a system to teach their staff as well to kind of take on board um but ideally it was done in a fun way so our branding was you know the meat and potatoes logo was kind of looked like a sausage and two potatoes which looked like a dick and balls but it made people look at it a little bit differently going oh my god how do you get away with this but yeah my target market were the youth, the people who wanted to rebel. Who so. wouldn't be offended by a penis on their workbook. <laughs> I no. mean, I took the course. So as if that's saying anything. <laughs> <laughs> and you loved, you loved, you loved the branding, right? I you loved it. it. I have stickers everywhere. <laughs> so we did stickers and badges and yeah. t-shirts and tote bags. And we just tried to change the way people looked at education to realize Instead of it being a boring and, oh, my God, why are you here today? Yeah. Oh, my boss told me to. Tried to change it up a little bit to have, bring a lot more fun, but make students actually want to be there rather than having to be there. 
Yeah, it's really good. Did you have someone help you with that? Like a marketing or um, design, something like that? It just was what came to you naturally. Yeah, cool. Like I, I love branding. I think branding is yeah. the best thing in the world. And I do a lot of branding based on a lot of the new business we start or the products we bring out or yeah. education that we, we launch. Branding to me is everything. And I think, one, you can have the best product in the world, but if it looks uncool, and people yeah. aren't into it, it's not eye-catching, no one's going to use it. Yeah. Um, it's got to be bloody pretty, a pretty incredible product for people to stop in their tracks and go, oh, my God, what's this? Yeah. So the branding side of things was my way to almost market what we're doing and encapsulate because I wasn't – I was, like, six years into it. Like, I wasn't the biggest name in education by any means. I was competing against your, um, you know, like your Sharon Blaine's. I was, mm. you know, my Benny Tognini's. Like, these big names in, in Australian um, education that – I was like, man, I can't, you know, Tracy Hughes, like these guys were all the guys who were killing it in education. And I just wanted to offer something a little bit different to what they were doing. Yeah. And did you get um, like flack, I guess, for that too? Like, were they like, what the hell is this? Like disgracing our industry with these meat and potatoes? Or do you think it like they were open to the change? I hope so. At the time as well, there was still probably a lot of bosses that weren't super young, like there is now. Yeah. So a lot of my leads came from the staff, and I, as I've realised, you know, having the salons, it's like if your art, your staff ask for it enough, they will get what they want. So yeah. if one person says, "I want Jules to come and teach his dick and balls education in my salon," they're going to go, "Yeah, whatever." But if you have all five of your staff saying it, yeah, um, that's where everything came through. Instagram went off. I realized yeah. that Instagram wasn't a social media platform for me, but it was a, a marketing tool. Yeah. Um, I do about 80% of my bookings through Instagram now. Um, really? Email is great, but hairdressers don't check emails. It's not exciting when you get an email. It's yeah. exciting when you get a DM though. 100%. So, That's how I came get all my guests for my shows. DM, I DM everyone. You reach out. So to this day, I still do. All, all of my contracts are based on my Instagram DMs. Like I try to bring it back to emails, but... Yeah, they never get back to me. So I just go, here you go. Here's your quote. Here's your thing. Send me your billing details. These are the dates. This is what we're going to learn. Yeah. Send me through a mood board. Let's do it. And I think the company's changed a lot where we were doing a lot more classes. We still bring those classes into what we do now, but we're now really focusing on in salon private education. We mm. work, we look after a lot of big salon groups around Australia. We look after a lot of smaller, you know, suburban salons. We look after pretty much anything. There's a lot of people yeah. who bring me into regional areas and we'll, um, We'll organize a class with you know three or four different salons and bring me in to do a, a class for two or three days which is great and now we're doing a lot of back-to-back -back education i think everyone's realizing that one day is great but being able to do two or three or continuous learning is a way that people can actually hold your information as well yeah so it's been amazing so i don't have to work with as many salons these days as because i'm kind of working more with you know, bigger salon groups or, sal or smaller salon groups or regional areas. And it's probably quite helpful for you going in, say you're working, you're going into do class for one salon versus say when I did my course, there was 10 of us in the class from all different salons. So first you have the awkward, everybody kind of like not knowing each other, doing the icebreakers, you know, whereas when you go in, you already have a leg like, is they all know each other's style. They know maybe each other's weaknesses to be like, oh, you should ask him this. This is what you struggled with yesterday or things like that. I think it would be beneficial having that. And these are the things you learn as well. Like normally you do a class, as you know, Crystal, it's like you do a class, it takes till four o'clock in the afternoon for them to warm up and start asking questions. And then the class is over at five. Yeah. And you're like, guys, what? why didn't we start like that? So I started yeah. doing two day classes. And then ah, day two would be and great. And they're more comfortable with you as well by the second day. You just ask questions. Like I always ask my, I my classes and I go, there's no dumb people, just dumb questions. And people just kind of relate back and go, yeah, cool, cool, cool. Try to make it really forward. I used to do a lot of handouts and gifts and, you know, giveaways, people who ask questions in the class to make it warm. But I always sit down on their level. I always spend the first probably hour of my classes just getting to know who who I'm working with and whatever, like give everyone a voice to be able to tell them, you know, what's their strengths and what's their weaknesses and what they want to learn today. And I do a lot of building my classes actually on the spot. Um, okay. I know what I'm good at. I know my strengths, but mm -hmm. sometimes you can be over-prepared and when they don't say what they want to learn is exactly what you're going to wanting to teach then them. You're, yeah, totally. 
throws you really hard. They're like, oh yeah, but I didn't want to learn bobs today. I'm like, yeah, but I, but I did head shakes up the bobs. And they're like, yeah, I wanted to learn like belly arch hair haircuts. And you're like, oh, okay. Um, so now uh, I've been working with a lot of salon groups who I get all the people in the class, to, uh, all the people in the salon to do mood, mood boards and send them through to my, my Insta. Oh. And I just log them all. And I figure out all the, lo- like the similar looks and I kind of go, okay, this is what I'm thinking for your two days. We're going to do something long and pretty and really commercial that you can use on every one of those long hair um, clients. We're going to do something mid-length with a bit more texture. So we're going to talk about texture and how to bring out more texture into your hair, if it's natural texture or if it's straight or if it's yeah. curly yeah. and try to work with textures. We might do a morning on fringes and we might end the day on nailing a, you know, a, uh, a bob with weight taken out. And you kind of work on techniques but put those techniques back into our haircuts and we use That's very similar right. techniques That's all the way right. through but then everyone feels like they get touched on or you know if you have a more advanced group you might end up with the the end of the day getting everyone to bring in a photo of something they want to tackle and we break that haircut down for them and then give them a hand on how to break down a photograph that a client brings in that's exactly um, that's that exactly, makes me feel good. That makes me feel good. <laughs> that's um, exactly what I do on my education. At the in the last hour, I have everybody bring out the photo that they're shown the most, and how do you feel that now from what you've learned, how would you approach this differently, or what technique of my three balayage paints that I've showed you can you apply into that? But I think the mood board in advance is a really great tip that. That's how you're curating that class for them. Otherwise, you could go in with a bunch of long haircuts and they only want to learn short. You're totally right. I got these, I got a couple the other day. And look, sometimes you get them and you understand what kind of caliber the hairdresser is at, what what kind mm-hmm. of level they're at. If they're giving you lots of, you know, concave bobs or lots of shorter pixie haircuts, it gives you an idea of what their clientele looks like. Oh, totally. It also has been really interesting. I got a couple in the other day. These things were works of art. Like these girls who put their mood boards together like a magazine. Yeah. And I'm reading these and I'm looking at them. And I've just said to the owner, I'm like, oh, God. where's Betty? I need Betty to do this class. <laughs> this girl is amazing. This girl is ama- like, I want her, I want to hire her to do branding for me. Like to sh- see the amount of effort shows me how keen they are. And it, yeah. it does, it gets you really excited, but it also gives you a touch of people's personalities. That, so before you work, walk in, like any educator comes in, you walk in the door, you're on show. Um, I'm a pretty out there person anyway, but you do, you lift your level to a room. You end up adapting to what comes at you as totally. well. So it's a really nice way of starting the day and a really nice high to know that you're so welcomed in, into a salon because they made a massive effort. Yeah. So that's really, a really nice way of just reading your, reading your audience. And I think more so with education, I know how to cut hair, I know how to teach it. It doesn't, it's not the thing that worries me. It's about trying to connect with every single person in the room. And normally the person that I find the hardest to connect with is my big, biggest downfall in a, in a class a lot of the time because you spend so much time trying to convert them. But when you do and you get that smile or that nod of engagement at the end of the day, you're like, all right, I, I feel like, did you like today? Or I'll message them after a class. I'm like, how did you go? Yeah. Oh my God, best class ever. And I'm like, oh, you would have fooled me, mate. I thought you hated me. They're like, no, no, I was just really concentrating. And I was like, cool. So I think that reading people has um, taught me a lot about people and just in life in general, just being able to yeah. understand and read body language. It's funny. So awesome. cool. So initially when you started doing education, it wasn't for your own program. You were affiliated with a product company. And how oh, yeah. did that come about for you? Like, did you approach them? Did they approach you? And then your international education i'd love to dive into as well okay um so education originally i was an apprentice i was working for a brand called matrix at the time my dad was working there i was the bad smell of him i used to follow him around and do everything and i think i was in front of people enough i was also a little bit older i started my apprenticeship when i was 23 so we're talking about 25 26 (laughs) when i first started educating um I had a chance to do a, an apprentice workshop uh, for Matrix all around Australia, which is great. So I did that for a couple of years. And then I, I was approached by Evo, uh, a brand that hadn't had any runs on the board, hadn't done any education and was like, we're talking two or three years in, um, had launched in Australia, but only softly. And they were looking to bring someone in that didn't have a name in the industry and could kind of build with them. 
This is yeah, about nine nine years ago, I reckon. Um, and that was awesome. It was so good to work with something from from grassroots. Um, I had no idea. I was teaching what I got taught. Yeah. I was teaching steps. Um, the answers that I must have given classes back in the day must have been really special. Like, why are you doing that? Uh, because I said so. I don't like. Yeah. I probably didn't have the reason behind things. And yeah. pretty much my biggest thing about education now is you, you have to teach why. If you don't teach why, then they can't use that skill long term. Yeah. They can only use it on that look. Um, but yeah, I was fresh. I was I was rubbish. I saw some of my old classes the other day um, when I was going through some archives, and I was like, holy dooly. That's horrible. But it's funny how much you can improve though. Like it goes, you know, that education, the way I taught or, you know, it's, it's true that you don't have to be who you are now when you begin. You just have to begin. Mm -hmm. Put yourself out there. I'm sure I wasn't getting paid that much. I'm sure people weren't spending, you know, 500 bucks to spend the day with me. So I guess it was, it's all, it's all parable, I guess. So uh, I start off early. These guys had a lot of belief in me. I loved getting on stage. So I think sometimes the hardest thing is personality. Yeah. Uh, I know when I've hired, hired all the people that have worked for us through Little for Top, I look for personality first and then skill-based second. I can teach someone how to do hair and explain hair. I can't teach someone how to connect with a crowd, feel warm. I feel the best people I've ever had working for me are the people who get up in front of someone and people either can listen to them for hours or they want to be them. And it's a very mm. inspiring thing when you go, oh, my God, you're so cool. I want to be you. And they start, you know, yeah. building those affiliations of love to that educator. They want to do everything and anything they touch, they want to buy. So if you can find those right people who, yeah. you know, and I see it, education's everywhere now. There's yeah. some people who are really, really good. And there's some people who's, who are an amazing hairdresser but don't connect as well to their audience as well. So. 100%. And so how did that start taking you overseas? Because obviously, like we said, that's how we met. And that's something that I think hairdressers, you know, when you when your eyes open to the potential of the industry that you can work more than just behind the chair, but it's like, it seems unattainable. And that's kind of how I started the podcast on how do you go from being behind the chair to an international tour going around all of America? And, you know, how does that happen? Um, I was just like right, right place, right time. I was with, uh, I was with Evo. Evo had decided to launch into the US as their first international market yeah. after New Zealand. And um, I, I was kind of one of the, you know, six educators I had at the time. And I got to go on a, a you know, I guess come along for the ride on one trip and realised I loved it. And I love American people. Um the North Americans, I think having an accent. And Thank you. You some, said North Americans next. North Americans, yeah. I was Canada. waiting for that. <laughs> Canadians are quite good, but, no, but I love them. They're, they're, and the difference between probably Canadians and Americans, for anyone who doesn't realise, Canadians are probably a little bit more like us. They're probably a little bit more chilled and mellow. And I found a lot of my Americans, they were so outspoken, but it was the best because you walk into a class mm -hmm. and instead of getting to four o'clock to warm the class, your, your class is warm in the first 15 minutes because yeah. everyone... Not everyone, but people are really open to sharing and being out and making you feel welcome. Um, yeah. it, it's amazing. So your day start off on a really big high. And I love that. Um, I think the gimmick of me being over there was I was young at the time. I think a lot of people were wondering why I was there. Um, I could do hair, which was, you know, a, you know, a side Added thing. bonus. <laughs> had an accent that no one could understand me. Mm -hmm. um, I can speak American girl for people who don't understand Australian Aussie Jules. Oh. Um, I taught myself, but everyone, no one wanted to hear American girl Jules. Everyone just wanted to hear Aussie, Aussie guy yeah. uh, Jules. And it was funny, people would go, I didn't have it, understand anything you said, but you do great hair and you're really entertaining and I just love your, your accent. Um, and I think also being a bloke in the, in the hairdressing industry is a little bit different uh, for the States. It's like you're a minority and I was straight. And yeah. for some reason, that little gimmicky thing, and I worked for a brand that didn't give a fuck. We broke the rules. We changed yeah. the way that we did launches. It wasn't a multinational. So we could do things on a whim and change our presentation night to night. So we drove, we launched California first, and we drove in the back of a, a pickup, uh, like a, like a pickup Tahoe. What are they? Yeah, big pickup truck. 
We yeah. had the whole back loaded with all our stock and banners and chairs and stools and hot tools and all my kit. And we drove from city to city all the way up the Californian coastline, all the way up to San Francisco from uh, San Diego, Wales vagina. And um, all the way, no, you don't know that? Um, um, from San Diego all the way up. And every night we would stop, we'd do, a sh we'd do prep with models during the day, then we'd do a show at night. And at the end of the show, we would pack up, put drinks on for everyone to get to make sure everyone stuck around. And then we'd take everyone to drinks and dinner who was left around. And we built it on culture about, we built yeah. it about, Evo got me in originally by probably the, the bit that was outside of hairdressing. I love the product, love the brand, love the people, but the way they celebrated every night, they were like, come on, we're going for dinner, we're going for drinks. And it was this whole social aspect that everyone yeah. went down to earth. It didn't matter if you're the owner or the junior file manager, you all had a say and you're all together and you all did everything together. Yeah, um, I totally agree. And which was amazing. They had a really nice sense of bringing people together in culture, which I loved and I loved people. So I was like very happy to go and eat deep fried shit and drink beers with a bunch of hairdressers and it was the best thing ever. And then next morning we'd get in the car, we'd drive up, you know, you know, another three or four hours up the, uh, up the highway and do it again. And honestly, I loved it. I have a really strong work ethic. I could, I'm pretty good at backing up the next day after a few too many hot wings and beers. And um, we do it day after day, 21 days straight. And because I was working, but then I got to socialize every night, it gave me yeah. a really nice and then we got to drive. So we got to see America and we got to feel like, you know, we're kind of on tour. Um, I fell in love and that's kind of where all, all my effort went. America took off, North America took off, Europe started taking off and um, I got to come for the ride. So I did a lot of distributor launches originally. I think yeah. Evo is now with about, in about 40, 40 to 50 different countries. So wow. I got to launch pretty much most of those countries, um, which was awesome. And then I started getting into, instead of teaching the classes in those areas, I would start teaching the ambassadors with the distributors that we're with. And then also our, we have like a North American ambassadors, European ambassadors, um, Asian ambassadors, and then uh, Australasia, or well, I guess Australia, New Zealand ambassadors. So we'd go, uh, go around the world pretty much teaching ambassadors. Amer North America is probably the biggest market. We'd do two weeks in the States every year or, or twice a year. And we'd teach all the, ambassadors with the distributors and that would be about 250 people so we'd do you know two would split it in half and do an east coast west coast and we do a whole week teaching and it's just the best thing ever because it was a really nice way of making sure that you got to see everyone hear everyone's opinion um see where everyone's skill set is as well and see where they would excel and try to figure out where they would fit in if it's color or cutting or product knowledge or being more of a front man or spokesman for distributors or launching new salons it was amazing so that's probably my funnest role to date, I dare yeah. say. Dad, second. Oh, sorry. Rewind <laughs> that. Love being a dad. Husband, also <laughs> close first. <laughs> Professional TV watcher and then surfer. And that then, was the best moment of my life. I'm like, oh, my, cool, so you have a wife. Professional. Professionally. <laughs> oh, love that's you, funny. Love, that's, love so, you kids. <laughs> that's so cool. I think people don't realise that it can be that massive of a level, like to be international like that and go to different countries. It's not like you just went to America. Like that's something I've really enjoyed from doing this podcast is hearing all people's stories of things that you kind of wouldn't even know exist within the industry. And there's so many branches that you could go into. Yeah. And look, don't get me wrong. It, it's an amazing time. I think people see the, the gram and go, oh my God, Jules, it looks like you had the best time ever. And I did. I, I genuinely love work. Like I love the people I work with. I love the brands I, I collaborate with. I love hanging out with hairdressers and like-minded people. Um, there was a time there where my wife is in fashion and she was doing a lot of buying through Asia. She'd go to, you know, mainland China and end up doing buying trips in these towns in the middle of nowhere. And I'd be in New York doing classes and oh, wow. going out for dinner. And she's like, this is so not fun. Like, how come you're having fun? I'm like, yeah, I know, but we're still both getting paid, aren't we? Like, it's it's a job, but I'm generally, I, like, I love it. Like, I love yeah. doing it. The love makes you work. You can work harder and back back yourself up. I think ever since having kids, 
um, my trips have gone from eight week trips to about three week trips. Yeah. And I realized that now I do as much work I did in eight weeks that I do in, t- in three weeks now, purely because at the time I was taking days off to go and see where I was. And now I totally. just, yeah. back back. look, it's the, the glamour side. You got to love it. It's, it's, you know, it is tiring. They don't, they, I think a lot of times people don't realize I was actually, we were just talking about the upcoming hair festival, which used to be hair yeah. expo. Right. And I was like, this will be the first time I've ever been that I wasn't working it and didn't right. have to be in the call room at 6am. And I was looking at all the lists of all the different, um, I guess, classes and seminars that they're having. And I was like, this is actually as much as I was like, oh, like I have to buy a ticket and actually go, you know, like it. Come on, can someone just let me in as the PR person? <laughs> but <laughs> a podcast, don't you know? Yeah, hello. But no, but I thought, you know, it's actually going to be a very different side of seeing it because it is so tiring I had a girlfriend saying that we were she was going to go and book something for the Monday after and I was like I think you need to not underestimate how big that weekend is and that it is exhausting after when you've been prepping models on stage in the booth on the mic doing all this stuff then all the dinners all the parties like you know and you can't not, you get FOMO like me you can't not go to a party and you can't not oh, have yeah. a few drinks and you can't say no really? to a you know an after party it's really it's really hard but then they're my people like i, I, I love it that's my one time of the year where i get to hang out with all my hairdressing mates mm-hmm. and just talk hairdressing be with hairdressers like completely like surround yourself by hair and then the best thing is if you do go out and you have a few too many drinks or you stay up past your bedtime the best thing is the next morning when you have to get a call at, at you know 5 30 the people who are alongside you are the people who are alongside you at the bar yeah, last night and true. You're together and it's honestly, it's the hardest thing, but at the same time, you've got someone else there who's probably hurting more than you are. And you're like, well, not as bad usually as you. So, I'm <laughs> usually that person. And, but then, you know, give it an hour or two, adrenaline kicks in. And then you're, the first thing you say when you get home, you're like, I'm definitely going home early tonight. And you do it all again. And yeah. that's kind of what these tours are like as well. It's like you get FOMO, you miss out. But I reckon the best thing, And then probably the reason why I get so many gigs and do so many tours is the secret to my success is practically you don't go home after your class. You always build your connections, build your breach. Like I love people. So it makes it a little bit easier for me than I know some people are like, I I need some alone time, but alone time doesn't book you more gigs. Yeah. Your gig doesn't finish at five o'clock. Your gig finishes when the owner of the salon, the staff member, or the rep or you know the brand owner whatever it is kind of says it's up says it's done and I think a lot of my gigs feel because I'm a lot of time I'm last man standing but also I'm the first person to be there in the morning a little bit late but first person to be there and be on and on fire and you know what work ethic will get you a long way when someone knows that they can throw you in the deep end they know that you're going to look after their clients or look after their staff you're going to show them a good time but you're going to bring energy every day as well so yeah so true. I went to a course. I was actually taking a course last weekend and it was yeah. from like, not, yeah, you know, I do that now. What were you doing? I went to Jay Edwards and Kirstianne, um color course, actually. At Edwards and Kirstie think- Fitzroy. Yeah, it was really good. Good day. But I had said to my boyfriend, maybe we would go after to do something. I was like, it should be like nine to five. And it was like six something. And I was still in there. And he's texting me and I'm like, you gotta just, you know, like I am putting the chairs away, you know, or passing foil up or doing that because it's those little things that exactly, it doesn't end. Even when you're the one in the class, if you have that mentality that you're trying to maybe network a bit or, you know, just be present in there. Like I stayed until I was one of the last ones leaving. Totally. I think that, that, that is what sets it apart. I think since having kids, I feel a little bit bad about staying out till mm. bloody 3 a.m. still but when I'm away and I have no one to go home to it is it's like you hang out like those things don't go unnoticed by anyone I don't think yeah. sometimes they can say you you know again you're always the the bad smell who, who's always hanging about so you've got to add something but um oh, yeah, you, like, you some deodorant after this conversation I've learned from you the bad smell is your trademark hangs as long as the bad smell is fun and adds to the conversation, you're good. You're good. You can deal with a bad smell as long as they're, as long as they're good vibes. 
Um, but it's true. And it, do, it doesn't end at that. And a lot of people outside of our industry, like our partners or our friends or our parents, yep. they don't get it. A lot no. of people in our industry don't get it. So yep. I think sometimes there's a special bunch. And I think I always want to see people's work ethic better. I always get a bit let down when people don't go as hard as I do. But then I guess that's what makes people special is that everyone's a little bit different. And not everyone's fighting for the same thing that you want as well. Mm-hmm. So that's something I don't I've learned. Myself recently. Other, but you just you, and if you don't love doing it, then don't do it. That's pretty much my call. But um, if if you want to get somewhere and, and you enjoy that, then throw yourself in the deep end, and I think you get taken on by people really well with a really good work ethic. Love it. The only thing I feel like we didn't touch on with this was the fact that you won Educator of the Year four years. I think you missed one year in the middle, but you've won that title four years, haven't you? Yeah, you should retire on it. Hey, let someone yeah. else. Come on. Shot. Let me have it. <laughs> yeah, I can give you the honest truth. Um, yeah, tell me. I don't do it for the awards. Um, the awards come at a time where it's like, what have you done this year? Write it all down. See what it looks like. You're only entering things that you've done. Uh, I don't try to do more gigs or less gigs or different gigs based on an versatility on my submission like i i couldn't give a rats but to be acknowledged as yeah. you know an educator of the year based on the work that you do that you love fucking amazing like if you want to enter australian hairdresser or queensland hairdresser or colorist or whatever it is you you got to put yourself forward you got to put yourself out there you got to do a collection spend big bucks mm-hmm. put a submission together like you actually actively have to go out there and chase it where i think the educator stuff you're doing it anyway. Like if you're out there yeah. and doing it, you might as well put it up there against everyone else. And it's kind of why I entered the first time and never, never thought I had a look in. And uh, I think I left my dad at the table in tears going, oh my God, <laughs> uh, proud it's moment because it, it's something I love as a business. It was a great business decision, but it's, you know, happened to be doing really well. And it gave me a really bit of a bit more motivation to go, okay, yeah. well maybe what we are doing is, is cool. And, Many people are actually uh, connecting to it as well. So yeah, it's been it's been amazing. It validates probably the hard thing about bit. educating is that as much as I have other people um, that work for us who are amazing educators, uh, and they start building their own vibe as well. A lot of people want them, not want me. But you can only be in one place at once as well. Yeah. Um, I find doing it. We've, we've been working a little bit of education to push out through online, which is hopefully coming a little bit later this year. We've filmed. Cool. Uh, I don't know about that 200 hours worth of footage, which is good, but it, I realised that was the easy part. Editing it all down and making it look good and um, making it tactile is is a lot harder. But um, yeah. the idea behind it was that to bring what we're doing a little off top um, online as our education program and try to keep all our sessions to under 10 minutes. So mm-hmm. it's something that if you know you have a, a concave bob coming in as your next client and you're freaking, at least you can sit down, watch it on your lunch break or watch it on the, on the, you know, in the toilet she gets her hair washed. while you're hitting yourself about this haircut and actually be able to kind of go, cool, tip, 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 cool. Okay, cool. Feel like you can tackle it in a really easy and lighthearted format as well. I think everything we try to do is we put a little bit of, uh, a little bit of entertainment into everything that we try to do as well to make it a little bit more of a visually pleasing as well. Love it. Well, I feel like I've really gained a lot of knowledge from this conversation. Yeah. I appreciate your time. Your phone hasn't gone off. My internet hasn't cut out. We've done really well today, I think. Your AirPod might be around in your tea, but that's it. <laughs> it's definitely broken as well. God damn. God damn. Don't invoice me for that, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for having me. It's been lovely thank chatting you. to you. Love You're seeing you. You're a little ray of sunshine, aren't you? Oh, even today. Thank you. Today is actually my editing day, and I'm like, Oh, you know, I'm going to have to wash my hair maybe and get all dolled up for you. So here I, this is it. I didn't realize we were videoing it. Well, I would have at least undone one more button, but um, that <laughs> You know, most um, people listen rather than watch, but just so everyone knows, we are on YouTube if you'd like to check this guy out. <laughs> you on YouTube? You're on YouTube? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. anyway, I was going to say, it's to you, darling. It's, um, you know, the Unfoiled series is epic. I love it. I like oh. it really is a nice way and you're building and building and building and look you're since first round that we did this where it was a complete shit show mate your interviewing skills is just 
really impressive. You know what I'm we still going to keep <laughs> in? Remember when I put my foot up? It was something about feet and my foot was like blue. <laughs> I'm still going to use that because that was really funny. If I do Good. say so myself. Well, <laughs> not like having tickets on yourself, but yeah, very right. funny. Love it. Very Thank you so much for your time. You're welcome, babe. See ya. Get it. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of The Successful Stylist Unfoiled. Don't forget to follow, like, and subscribe on Spotify, iTunes, and YouTube to get all the notifications of our weekly episodes.